Okay. Welcome to another episode of Riverside Community Health Foundation's Let's Talk About Community Trauma series, where we host ongoing community conversations addressing trauma that has been manifested on the community level and how it relates to your health. Tonight's topic, racism in the AAPI community. My name is Anna Holbrook, and I'm the Director of Marketing Development for Riverside Community Health Foundation. And I'm honored to be your host tonight um, for a very special conversation with Congressman Mark DeCano. Congressman Takano represents the 41st District of California. Specifically, our communities of Riverside, Moreno Valley, Perupa Valley, and Paris in the United States House of Representatives. For more than 20 years, Congressman Takano has worked to improve the lives of Riverside County residents, both as an elected official and as a teacher at, in Rialto High School in our very own community. He was the first openly gay person of color to be elected to Congress and serves as the vice ranking member of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, is a member of the Education Workforce Committee and the Science, Space and Technology Committee. That's quite a lot. Congressman DeCano, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. I just wanna, somebody sent you a, an old bio because I'm, I'm not the vice ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I am the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. And I no longer sit on science, space, and technology. I am a senior member of the Education and Labor Committee. So that's a really old piece of um, stuff there you have. So. Well, I'm so sorry. Well, um, your fault. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, you didn't know. <laughs> um, well, I, I definitely have some notes about some amazing things that you have done over the years, and I know that you have done so much work in the community, so thank you so much, and we'll have a chat with the office later. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. Why not um, <laughs> so tonight, we will be discussing the recent surge in violence and hate crimes against the Asian Pacific American, um, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, and or henceforth, um, just so it, it's a little bit easier to say, we'll just call it the AAPI community. Is that yeah, okay? That's fine. Okay. So thank you again so much for joining us. Um, you know, as as a my my parents actually immigrated from Vietnam after the Vietnam War, um, which makes me actually the first born Vietnamese generation with um, Asian American within within our family. And you know, as I grew up, I always felt as though AAPI issues were often underrepresented. Um, has this been your experience, Congressman? Um. I would say yes, somewhat. I mean, I think it's because uh, AAPIs are have many different subgroups. We're far from a monolithic community. And so most often, most often the issues that arise within the community arise within um, sub-ethnicities, the Vietnamese community, um, the Japanese American community, the Chinese American community, the Korean American community. Um, I would say for the most part, the issues that arise tend to be issues within those communities. Um, they each have their own different histories uh, with this country. They immigrated at different times. Um, there's old and new AAPI uh, immigration based on which community you're talking about. Um, for instance, uh, your uh, family uh, arrived probably a lot more recently than my family. My family on both sides, my mother's and father's side of the family arrived um, uh, while well, my grandfather Takano arrived like maybe 1916. Um, some of my mother's forebearers might have been here, I think even before the beginning of the 1900s and late, the late 1800s, they were here. And of course, some Chinese Americans, Chinese Americans have been uh, in our country, and they were part of building the railroads, part of laborers that built uh, the railroads across the country. And that's the you know the 1860s and 1870s. Um, and of course, a lot of the main Vietnamese immigration came uh, in the wake of the Viet Vietnam War. 
Uh, so in, not only Vietnamese, but Cambodians and Laotians and Hmong, that's three more ethnicities I just mentioned. And each one of those ethnicities has its own specific history and their own specific challenges. And so often Americans as a whole uh, won't necessarily get to know what those issues are um, uh, because they're not as, as sort of uh, generalized across the entire AAPI community. Uh, so we will often hear issues about the African-American community uh, and uh, there are certain sort of, I think, commonality ac across regions. And, and it, you know, there's, there's discontinuities and uh, exceptions and um, subgroups within the African-American community too. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I would say in general, there's a, there's a, a history a broader history that um, most African Americans will share, you know, um, you know that's the legacy of, of slavery and uh, Jim Crow in the South. Um, there's there's as a there's a broader history that uh, I think is sort of more recognizable to more Americans. I think it's more difficult for Asian Americans as a community as a whole, as as one AAPI community, to have. Um, their issues always out there because it differs between the different groups. It's really about experiences then, right? Because the, amongst the different types of racism and immigration. Yes, yes. I, I, I think um, it will show up in different ways for different folks. So it's like, um, you know, the, the racism showed up uh, for Japanese and Chinese Americans in history. Um through laws like the um, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, the Japanese Exclusion Act, those actually prohibited uh, immigration and really cut off immigration from those countries in the early part of the 20th century, the late, the latter part of the 19th century. Um, I'm betting that when your family arrived uh, as immigrants, that they arrived like in the 70s uh, or later. Um, and by that point, uh, Asian immigrants could become naturalized citizens. Uh, do you know that before 1965, uh, with some exceptions, uh, but for the most part, um, becoming a naturalized American citizen was not possible for an Asian immigrant. Uh, if you immigrated to the United States from China or Korea or Japan or any East Asian country uh, in the 19th century, uh, you did not have a pathway to citizenship. My grandfather, when he immigrated to the United States in 1916 as an 18-year-old boy or a young man, he could not become a citizen. There was not a pathway for him to become a citizen until they opened up quotas for such naturalization in the 1960s. Um, and some Asian immigrants like Filipinos and South Asians were able to get uh, not paths to naturalization uh, in the late 1940s. Um, but since the beginning of our country, uh, that, was a, that was really a strike against you um, uh, if you were Asian, if you were Asian immigrants. Your children, because of birthright citizenship, could become citizens. Um, and so, um, and there was a there was a Supreme Court case which established that in the late 1800s, it was a Chinese. I'm forgetting the name of the of the litigant, but uh, he was an American-born Chinese man, uh, and I think the court ruled that the birthright citizenship established under the 13th and 14th amendments of the constitution, the, the, the civil war amendments, of the constitution applied also to, um, uh, the children of, of Asian immigrants who lived here. So, um, you know, this actually has some, some relevance to Riverside history. Um, you've heard of Harada house. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, Harada House was was a, a case that was brought about by Jukichi Harada's neighbors in the early part of the 19th century, uh, 1900s. Um, the neighbors sought to enforce the alien land law. That's another law uh, that uh, was anti-Asian. Uh, and that law, the alien land law said that people who were ineligible to become citizens, and who were those people? Immigrants from Asia. They didn't outright say, you know, Japanese people can't buy. And California, well, no, California law might have said that, but the ways in which the laws were often structured is they said, well, you know, if you're ineligible to become a citizen, you can't own property. And who did that apply to? It applied to immigrants from Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these were alien land laws. And so Jukichi Harada's neighbors sought to enforce that law. What Jukichi Harada did is that instead of buying property in his own name, he bought it in the name of his American born children. Uh, and they said, well, that's, that's getting around and evading the law, which it, it was getting around law, but the judge upheld Jukichi Arata's ability to do this. And that's why the Harada House is a, is a national historic monument. It's actually a fairly important part of uh, the history of Asian Americans and specifically Japanese Americans in our country. Uh, it's that piece of history right in here, right our own downtown Riverside. Yeah, you know? right in our backyards. Isn't wow. that cool? Uh, yeah. yeah you know, um, I, and I think um, we have an important tool mm -hmm. uh, for our citizens and especially our young people to know that this history, what this history was. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, so I, I um, so look, uh, 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 th this anti-Asian sentiment was not just with Japanese Americans. It was, it happened first with the Chinese immigrants um, and it continued in various ways with other immigrant groups. How do you think that's, that, 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 perception of more overt racism has kind of evolved over time. Um, you know, like for me, I'm thinking about some of the stereotypes that, that, that I knew growing up. <laughs> well, okay. What I see happening in our country is that it was overt, mm -hmm. <laughs> like really on the surface, like straight out they passed laws. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want Asians here. We don't want Japanese here. We don't want Chinese here. Uh, we don't want the competition they bring. Uh, they're taking over. In fact, uh, there was a, a term um, uh, called the yellow peril. Uh, that was, it was the yellow peril and the Hearst newspapers owned by William Randolph Hearst. He owned a string of newspapers all throughout uh, the West Coast. Uh, and those newspapers uh, propagated uh, the notion that, uh, that Asian immigrants were taking over uh, the United States. And, um, uh, so it was overt. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't like covert. It wasn't dog whistling. Mm -hmm. you know, dog, dog whistling is kind of like, you're kind of dog whistling is that you kind of want to avoid being called a racist, but you, you say something that everybody can understand what you mean. The racists can hear, you can connect with other racists out there, but you say it in a way that uh, other, uh, that generally you can't be accused of being a racist. You can say, well, I wasn't saying, I wasn't saying that. All I said was whatever, but it's a, it's something that, uh, that was widely understood. People understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think politics went that way for quite a while. And I think in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of dog whistling. Um, I've been watching this amazing series on Showtime about the Reagans. And there's this, you know, there's this general sense among a lot of people, among Republicans especially, that, you know, Reagan was this, you know, um, great president. Um, the more I'm looking at some of the, I mean, I may be this, this, this this series may be very slanted, uh, but you know there was a lot of dog whistling 
that, that Ronald Reagan did. Ronald Reagan had to campaign in a dog whistling sort of style. Mm -hmm. um, he went to Philadelphia, Mississippi and made it clear how he was going to govern in a way. Uh, so when he, uh, so uh, I can't remember what he said. I mean, he, he was going to govern in such a way uh, that he was on the side of white people who were afraid uh, or concerned or resentful uh, about the gains of black people. Um, the, the idea of a welfare queen. Uh, the welfare queen uh, is ostensibly about attacking the fecklessness of government, the ineffectiveness of government and how government uh, wastes your tax dollars and is taking your tax dollars and giving it to people of color who don't deserve it. That's a good example of, of like dog whistle politics uh, because on its face, it doesn't, it can be defended as not racist. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about that the people of color are, are don't deserve things. I, 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 I'm just defending the taxpayer and I believe in smaller government. Um, you know, I believe in conservative principles. But in fact, um, that's a dog whistle. You can say the same thing. I mean, I think, I think the term law and order, uh, which was used by Richard Nixon, um, law and order were, were code words. Uh, code words, code words is another way to talk about dog whistling. I think what we saw in the past four years, <laughs> before Joe Biden became president, is an amazing, uh, shocking uh, departure from dog whistling to straight out racism. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to wear the racism on my sleeve, and and it was justified by justified by um, Donald Trump in particular talked about it. I'm I'm tired of the political correctness. Um, he actually said that about political correctness. I mean, these these libs and their political correctness. Um, uh, and so he was able to attack a Mexican-American judge uh, and uh, throw doubt on that judge's ability to, uh, to render a judgment in a lawsuit that he was involved with. And he, 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 he went specifically after that Mexican-American heritage of that judge. Uh, I was watching, this is early on, this is early on in the campaign. Um, you know, he was attacking Obama's, President Obama's, uh, or Barack Obama, he was then President Obama's, um, you know, birth certificate. It, it was, I mean, he could say, well, this is, this is not racism. <laughs> it's defensible. I, I just concerned that somebody who's, who doesn't is not really a citizen has, has become president of the United States. That's not a racist thing. Anyway, I think so. What do I what do I think? Uh, I I think that uh, it stopped being dog whistle. It stopped being code words. It started being like more direct. But but then there was a mix. There was still a mixture of code words still being used. Mm -hmm. Um by Donald Trump uh, and frankly by a lot of Republicans who have frankly decided to become the party of Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South. We're, and we're, seeing, we're seeing laws being passed all over the country to suppress voters in the name of election security. It, that's, that's the dog, in the name of election security, that's how they're gonna justify it. Uh, we're going to propagate the myth that an election was stolen. And because that election was stolen, that means that we have to pass a bunch of laws to prevent uh, and discourage and suppress voting. That's what's happening right now as we speak. It happened yesterday in the state of Georgia. You can't, I mean, they just passed a law saying you can't give food or water to people standing in line to vote. What is that? <laughs> what is that about? You know, like in um, talking about myths and ideas of, of 
of whatever it is, um, myths in general, stereotypes, really. I, 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 you know, I think about, again, how I was raised and um, my experience. And one of the main stereotypes that I always heard was the term model minority. Um, and, you know, I, so I was hoping if you, you know, do you, are you aware of that terminology? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's a pernicious thing, the model minority. Culturally, I think one thing that is shared among a lot of Asian ethnicities is um, a sense of compliance um, that children go to school and you never question the teacher. Your parents are usually going to like punish you no matter what. The teacher is always right. I mean, does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Great days. That's all I would be like, like, We're not gonna. It's like doesn't matter. My my parents just doesn't matter, and you know that was just that was somehow the way in many Asian cultures. I mean, not all Asian cultures are are, are that way, but I think, um, and so I think, uh, in Asian families tend to want their children to go into very practical professions. <laughs> something low risk, you know, high pay, low risk, be an engineer, you know, be a doctor, um, you know, be a lawyer. Do the things, yeah. Do the things that are going to like, you know, and they're not exactly wrong to be concerned about your economic viability. Um, and especially if you, if you're, if the family's immig immigrants, they, they, they're hoping to provide, they're frankly, they're looking out for intergenerational wealth building, you know, mm -hmm. that's really so important. But um, you know, not all not all Asians fit into this by by a long stretch of the imagination. As I said, some immigrant, some Asian immigrants have been here longer than others, a lot longer than others. And the the newer immigrant groups um, have yet to establish as a community. I mean, individual. In, individual uh, Vietnamese immigrants and individual Cambodian immigrants um, may be doing well, but but across the board, um, as a newer immigrant community, they're going to not be in the same place as uh, other Asian immigrants who arrived earlier as communities. Um, but even even those other older communities, I, as I kind of outlined to you, faced tremendous discrimination. Uh, and the newer immigrant communities often don't fully know the stories of those other Asian immigrant family uh, communities, right? So there's like, so that the the uh, struggle to like have a, a an Asian American identity um, is difficult. Those those times when we are able to experience that identity, unfortunately, is in times when. Uh, there's a generalized hatred against Asians. Uh, you know, um, it could be during a time of economic stress. It could be during a time of a pandemic. But let's get back to model minority. That's what the question you asked me. So model minority um, has to do with, I think, an impression of non-Asians, that Asians are smart, that they're wealthy, um, that they may not even be rightly classified as a minority um, or, or a kind of underrepresented minority. Um, and this is wrong. This is not fair uh, because uh, there are certain sub Asian sub ethnicities that are really struggling. Uh, and even those, even in those ethnic groups within the Asian community that have a lot of their members doing well, uh, there's still a lot of them that are not doing well at all um, and, are, and are struggling. Um, so the model minority is like this idea that, uh, that like we, we, we get pointed to as, see, they can do it. Why can't you? <laughs> that's, that's part of it too. See, they can do it. Why not you? Um, so yes, I've heard of it. Do you, do you think at all that that type of stereotype about being a model minority has impacted you in your own personal life or your family? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I'm also quick to add that um, 
that I think my family has benefited from programs like affirmative action, mm -hmm. um, whether in education or in employment. I remember having a talk with my father about this, that unless there were a specific consciousness of achieving diversity, unless diversity is sort of a, a social, um, I don't know, a social objective that we think about in, in business settings, in government settings and school settings, unless we think about, you know, hey, maybe, you know, our teacher core, we, we need to have, it makes a difference to have teachers of different racial backgrounds uh, in the classroom. Um, it makes a difference that all people of the different backgrounds have a shot at management jobs that you just, you know, it can't be that you, you can't have a perpetuating myth that Asians can't make good leaders and can't make good managers and can't be good CEOs kind of thing. Um, so I definitely think that um, uh, it's important. It was important to me, uh, I think, to have certain social and political um, initiatives that, that did promote diversity. Otherwise, I think I may not have been as successful as I am. Thank you. But that's, I, I think that is extremely important, you know, the, um, where, where we're talking about um, racism and being able to really point it out. I, I love how you were talking about the, um, like being very intentional about it. So intention, intention above all else to ensure that this is getting addressed. So, you know, I, I was doing some research beforehand and I was looking, I was looking at a research that was conducted by the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism. I know that's a long time respected source of expertise on hate crimes. Um, now the researchers pulled public records from local and state police agencies to gather hate crimes from 2019 and 2020. They compared the two numbers and it showed that there was a 149% increase in hate crimes in 2020 alone. And that's just absolutely astonishing to me. And what's even scarier still is that when they continue to look at the data, hate crimes had actually been down by 7% overall. And yet Asian hate crimes had increased by 149%. So I, you know, as we're talking about policies, I have to ask you, Congressman, why do you believe that there's such a high, stark, just a stark rise in hate crimes within the AAPI community during the pandemic? Well, I... <clears throat> I think there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment toward all Asian Americans uh, as a result of irresponsible actions and irresponsible words of our top leaders, uh, namely the former president, Donald Trump, used terms like China virus Kung flu, Kung flu is, is the one I think is the one, it's the worst. Um, but China virus, Wuhan virus, and Kung flu. And I remember watching the president speaking before, you know, a hotel ballroom filled with people. And he gets up to the microphone and, and, and he says, Kung flu. And the whole room just sort of lit up in activity. And, you know, I, I can't get inside the heads of all of the people who, who reacted, but my impression was that the people he was saying it to were delighted that here was a guy that's, you know, not holding back, speaking, speaking what he feels and speaking the truth. And, um, you know, there was that, you know, that people, people like this person who's not a politician and all that. But um, I mean, I, I, I could understand, you know, the, the way he was connecting with that group of people. Um, but I began, 
I began to, be, I was, I was gritting my teeth all these last months when, when I would see signs like that, when he would intentionally use terms like China virus or Wuhan flu. When at the very beginning of the pandemic in early January, um, when he hadn't started using uh, these terms, he was trying very hard to be solicitous of the president of China, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, um, Xi Jinping. And um, because he, he was uh, at that point, I think still in hope that a trade deal that he had negotiated with the, with the Chinese government was going to help him secure a lot of votes in the, the farmland, the heartland of our country um, with farmers uh, that export commodities and grains and pork bellies and all of that. And uh, when it became clear that the pandemic was becoming more and more out of control, that more people were dying, more and more people being infected, he needed to distract from what was happening uh, and to place the blame on something, someone else. Now look, the Chinese weren't as transparent as they should have been. They, they were, in fact, they were, they were deceiving. Um, and, that, and that was bad. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but the, the, uh, the way in which President Trump conducted himself, initially I thought he was going to be okay. Initially, when he was starting to hold those White House briefings for the American public, I, I thought there was a chance that he was going to actually take this seriously. Uh, but then he started to get into, uh, uh, you know, doing things like promoting hydrochloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, suggesting that maybe you should inject bleach, <laughs> uh, and uh, being very inconstant and erratic. Uh, and then I think the strategy was very clear, and it was actually documented in in Republican playbooks. Use uh, try to blame the Chinese for everything. Blame the blame the Chinese for everything. The problem the problem with with that is that it it had a generalized effect on Asian Americans. It was very irresponsible, extremely irresponsible. You know we don't you know I don't hear scientists or people or historians talking about the Spanish flu as the Spanish flu very much anymore. They call it the Great Influenza. Um, because I think there's a, an evolving standard of understanding that it's it's not really helpful. In fact, it's extremely harmful to try and ascribe uh, a virus that comes from nature uh, as resulting from a geographic area um, or a particular ethnic group or racial group and to therefore stigmatize a group of people with the virus that that's happened throughout history that's happened in europe uh actually with uh when, when the plague was blamed on jews um the jews would get blamed and scapegoated for terrible things that happened uh like the plague um and um and <laughs> that kind of stigmatization had consequences they were often beaten up brutalized killed in the name of that anger. And that was, of course, what I was very concerned with, along with like a lot of my other members of Congress who were uh, AAPI members of Congress. We were very concerned about that. So that rise, now I want to tell you something else, Anna. I think that uh, those statistics, even as we saw a, a lower overall rate of, of, of incidences, but yet an increase within the AAPI community, mm -hmm. I still think that there's a great possibility that the that the what happened to AAPI um, immigrants and uh, citizens in our country is underreported. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, there's not a it, it's all voluntary in terms of which police departments and local law enforcement agencies actually do the reporting, mm -hmm. and it's not it's not consistent. Mm 
how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so we might not be actually getting a full and accurate picture, but I think you can't. I mean, I think it's really hard to argue that there that there wasn't something that happened significant that negatively affected the API community in terms during during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and not only not only do I hold Donald Trump responsible, I also hold uh, uh, mostly Republican politicians mm -hmm. for uh, being complicit, either joining, either literally joining the president and using those terms, or deflecting and defending, and, and that's and it's still continuing to this day. There's there's not there's not a concerted effort to say what the president had, did was wrong. Or they, or where they contradict them. You know, in regards to you know talking about stigmas, um, I think that there's there's a lot of stigma that actually occurs within the the Asian American community. Um, like you had mentioned, underreporting of um, of hate crimes or violence um, within the community or outside of the community. I, that kind of leads into my my next concern. Really, is the stigma against mental health. Um, as these rises in in hate crimes continue, and as as we start to really discover the impact of words um, such slurs and whatnot, and how they impact our community, what has what has uh, the what has the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus (KPAC) that I know you're vice chair in? Um, what how is KPAC addressing these issues, especially on the on the health? the health level? Well, um, we are advocating for the passage of two pieces of legislation, the No Hate Act and the COVID-19 hate crimes bill. Um, in both cases, uh, the hate crimes bill is um, addressing the issue of making it easier to report, not easier, but uh, uh, systematizing uh, the reporting, uh, giving resources to the Department of Justice uh, and making a person uh, responsible at the Department of Justice for reviewing all of the uh, hate incidences that are occurring around our country and to have the Department of Justice issue guidance and support to local law enforcement agencies uh, to set up reporting systems and to make that reporting more consistent and useful. Um, it also provides resources for the law enforcement agencies to actually um, set uh, these reporting um, mechanisms up. It costs money and right now it's, it's voluntary and uh, law enforcement agencies have to make a choice about what they're going to do with the resources. We need the federal government to step in and say this is a priority during the pandemic, when a particular part of our country, particular part of our population of the country is being uh, stigmatized. Um, the No Hate Act uh, would also, it, it, it uh, seeks to, I think, provide community organizations with resources. Um, I, I think we need to do a lot of training. Um, maybe uh, training is not the word, but educating of our different communities. And that's going to happen within community organizations, nonprofits uh, that provide community services to the various Asian communities out there in a culturally sensitive way and uh, in that community's own language uh, so that we can educate people how to report a crime. Look at, uh, you know, a hate, crime is, a hate crime is very, very difficult to prove. Um, and you need to make sure you have the evidence there. And often the evidence is there, but uh, the community members may not know what it is you have to look for, what it is you have to see, um, how it is that you can be a quote unquote good witness. Um, you know, I, I'm not aware of specific initiatives to deal with mental health or the health of um there's a there's a more not Asian specific effort, but you know the the the, the new Congress and the president um, are looking to strengthen the Affordable Care Act uh, to 
make um, uh, the policies do more at less of a cost. Um, and you know, one of the elements of the Affordable Care Act is a requirement that policies uh, include mental health care. So uh, whether people are uh, seeking their health care here in California and in Riverside and Marina Valley, Paris and uh, Harupa Valley, whether they're getting their health care through uh, Covered California uh, uh, or uh, Medi-Cal, uh, the policies all include a mental health component. So those policies should cover mental health care. Um, there needs to be outreach uh, to AAPIs in their own languages. Um, they need to also know that um, if they've been the victim of harassment um, or they've been assaulted, they need to be able to report it, but they also need to be, have access to uh, the mental health counseling uh, to deal with that trauma. Um, people may not look, uh, some of our, I am chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee. When you have been a part of a violent scene, you've either, you know, as a soldier, airman or whatever, you were, you were actively involved in something, or you may even be somebody who is like guiding a drone from many miles away. There are mental health of consequences to the kind of work you're doing. Um, we, we have issues trying to destigmatize seeking help in the military, regardless of which ethnic group you may belong to. Um, I don't think Asians are alone. Asian Americans are alone in the in in how their cultures have stigmatized <laughs> stigmatized um, seeking mental health care. Uh, I think this is a generalized problem across all of America, in the, inside the military, inside law enforcement, inside a number of high stress pro uh, professions. Um, to uh, encourage and validate the people who need to uh, seek, need to get the counseling. So I, and I've, I've, I've myself as part, have participated in public um, affairs um, messaging uh, where we specifically encourage APIs to go and seek mental health care. Great. Access, absolutely. Access is a major component, um, as well as the destigmatization. So with um, education. I, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and as, as I was, I was, I was, I was reviewing some information, you know, I know that you are, um, you're a member of the House of Education and Labor, and I'm sure that you're aware that according to the census, the census pulse that was put out in May 2020, Asian owned businesses are some of the hardest hit sectors during the pandemic. Worse still, that these businesses are within sectors that have sustained some of the worst economic effects because of the pandemic. And then on top of that, still, <laughs> early data also shows that a pattern of unemployment rates being repeated during COVID-19. So Asian Americans' unemployment rates increased by 450% from February to June, revealing a greater rate of increase in other racial groups. And then more alarmingly, while overall unemployment dropped in May of 2020, unemployment rates in fact grew for our AAPI community. Um, with, with, it grew by 0.5 percentage points and then with um, 1.1% 0 .1 for Black workers. How is Congress responding to these individuals and business owners? Well, we've, Congress has responded generally to uh, the challenges of small businesses through the PPP program ever since we passed the CARES Act way back in March. Uh, and uh, supplemental relief bill in December, and even recently uh, up to $7.5 billion was added to the PPP program uh, in addition to the pre-existing money that was in the account. Uh, and the PPP program is, as you know, a program which uh, small business people can take out loans uh, and so long as they're keeping people employed, they can convert those loans into grants. 
So it's not actually a loan they have to pay back, but they have to meet certain conditions. Um, and the Biden administration held open um, a, a window for businesses that were below a certain size. It was a small business window. Um, so uh, AAPI, uh, small business people can take advantage um, of, of this program. I know some APIs with larger business that have actually larger businesses that have actually done this. The challenge, of course, is reaching um, uh, these business owners, uh, explaining to them how they can qualify uh, and how they apply, uh, and to do it, they may or may not have relationships to formal banking, um, and uh, so. Uh, you know, that's, that's the challenge. And uh, so we have to make sure that we have adequate outreach uh, as we would need outreach uh, in the terms of how we would train people to report hate crimes. They need to, we need to have robust um, community organizations that help these small businesses connect. Um, the unemployment that you mentioned, um, uh, we, we've extended unemployment insurance uh, through September. Um, and this is part of the rescue plan. Um, I know there's a lot of business people out there who are saying, well, I, there's not enough people working and um, they get more unemployment than they do kind of work. And, um, you know, I still think that that situation is um, something that we've got to kind of persist with. Um, not everybody has access to the vaccines. Um, I think uh, we're, we're seeing resistance among some parts of our community to get those vaccines, some hesitancy, let's put it that, that way. Mm -hmm. um, but even, even short of that, we've not had enough vaccine and we're starting to get to that point where we have a large amount of vaccines uh, to get it to everybody who wants a vaccine. Um, you know, I, I think, I think that resentment among some of our business owners that uh, uh, that people aren't coming to work, I think, will be more justified several weeks from now. Uh, but certainly not now. People do need uh, to be able to not have to be around other people where they can be exposed. And of course, um, uh, certain minority groups have suffered. Uh, infections at a more, far higher rate because they're working in, they are having to go to work. They are in essential work worker um, sectors. Uh, frankly, a lot of APIs uh, are in essential, uh, are essential workers, uh, and have had to have had to go to work. So, um, but for those, but for those who um, are also involuntarily out of work, uh, who would be working if they could, they need to, they need to have that, uh, that safety net of that extended uh, unemployment insurance. And, and I think the Congress did the right thing by extending that unemployment insurance to September. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I, I do think it's inconvenient for some of our business owners who say they, they can't get the workers. Uh, but that's also a sign to me that our economy is is um, is wanting uh, to get started up again. Um, I you know I can feel uh, the pent up energy and uh, desire to see things start to open up. So, uh, but in the meantime, I think we've given the American people through the American Rescue Plan uh, the tools to really open up safely. And that's not just you mentioned UI, but I'll mention also our, the money we've given to schools, the money we've given to universities. Um, to keep the idea was to keep everything sort of afloat um, while we're trying to get everyone vaccinated, while we're trying to um, race ahead of all these variants that are occurring because of the replication of the virus. And we still need people to be, um, I think, cautious. Um, especially those that haven't been vaccinated yet, we still need people not to get too complacent and act cavalierly. 
No, um, you know, finally, when to so to your to your AAPI community, yes. um, can you address you can you address the community and just let them know what is Congress currently working on? How are you guys? How are you and Congress addressing the anti-racism and discrimination within within not only our community but um, our entire country? And what can we expect to see? Well, to the AAPI community generally, and to the AAPI community here in uh, Western Riverside County, um, let me just say that it, it just just a, this this week uh, there was um, reported to me an incident of a nail salon um, that was sent. Um, and I think the employees were sent this letter, which purported to come from the Social Security Administration. It was a fake letter uh, that used all sorts of despicable anti-Asian slurs, um, you know, telling you know the owner of the salon and the employees that uh, they needed to go back to where they came from. Um, it was disappointing to hear that the kind of anti-Asian sentiment that we've been hearing around heard about around the country has occurred in our own community. Uh, I promptly called it out, um, denounced it, and uh, what the AAPI, AAPI leaders in Congress are doing is we're, you know, making uh, media appearances, we're attending rallies. In fact, I intend to attend a rally tomorrow here in Riverside uh, to you know, call attention to the anti-Asian uh, sentiment, the anti-Asian harassment and assaults and murders. Um, and, uh, and hopefully it's going to open up a larger conversation about that. But we're also, you know, beyond just awareness, we're looking to actually pass, as I said, the COVID-19 hate crimes bill. And we're also looking to pass the No Hate Act uh, and we're doing our best to like make, uh, uh, I think one of the biggest differences that we made is by frankly, by my Republican colleagues, who I think not only need to start to stop embracing the Trumpist ideology, uh, which frankly relies on a lot of racist narratives, uh, to not embrace it, they need to actually distance themselves and break with it. Uh, I see the exact opposite happening right now. Um, perhaps this is a moment uh, that will uh, tamp that down, tamp, tamp the, tamp the, uh, uh, the continuance of, of uh, the xenophobic, uh, anti-Asian, anti-minority, uh, ways in which uh, certain politicians are appealing to their base voters, what they perceive their base voters to be. Um, I will point out that I think it's made a difference that there are uh, that there are poli that there are members of Congress who are of AAPI descent. Uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, uh, what eighty years ago. Uh, that wasn't the case, and uh, there was a failure of the political leadership. There was a, a, a failure of political leadership to stand up to uh, the hysteria of anger that whipped up against um, the Japanese immigrant and Japanese American community here in the United States. And that's what resulted in my mother and father as little children being interned. Imagine little children considered enemies of the state and needing to be put into concentration camps or internment camps. Um, we have now the most, one of the most uh, diverse Congresses in history and it's, it's made our country better and stronger uh, to stand up to this eruption of um, racist sentiment. Um, and it's really important to have leaders speak out against it uh, and to take action against it. And for communities 
across the country um, to also show their support. And uh, I was really, really inspired to see during the summer a multiracial, uh, a multiracial presence of young people, especially uh, who were demonstrating um, against the the murder of, of George Floyd. I thought, uh, and, and others, Breonna Taylor, others that were uh, in the African American community that were um, that were murdered. Uh, there was an awakening of the country. Uh, and what was amazing is that um, uh, I, I feared that the that there was going to be a backlash against these demonstrations around the country. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm thinking about uh, in 1972 uh, when Richard Nixon campaigned on law and order in reaction to many of the social uprisings around the country uh, and campaigned against uh, what he would characterize as the chaos and disorder um, that I thought that something similar could happen uh, after last summer and into the fall, uh, these uprisings. But I think, I think the majority of Americans have responded uh, by opening their eyes. Uh, and I'm truly hopeful that our country is going to become a stronger country um, because we're going to we're, we're, we've, we're going to acknowledge a lot of things that weren't right even before the pandemic. The pandemic kind of revealed a lot of things that weren't right, uh, and that we have an opportunity to undo a lot of the things that weren't. Right. So, all the elections that weren't right that got revealed and that we can now make right. And so we are in this period now of revealing all of the wrongs, deconstructing those wrongs, understanding the systems that have made these wrongs persist over time uh, and begin to be able to right those wrongs. Uh, so I think, I think, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I know it's true for me. AAPIs for the last several months have have been gritting their teeth uh, at uh, what we all knew uh, could result in far worse things. And indeed, things were happening, but things that things were happening. People were elders were being killed and shoved and people pay faces were slashed in certain communities uh, and uh, the as we see empirically the statistical rise in incidences um, but it but it took you know it took a murder of like six women uh, by a crazed person and yes I do believe this had something to do with hate this had something to do with Asian businesses it had to do with Asian women uh, and it happened in the context of all of this, that all of what happened across the country. And I think it's opened the country's eyes to, yeah, this, this is not a good thing that uh, we allowed an irresponsible leader to say things. Uh, and their words have consequences. And so I think what I have to say to the AAPI community is that we, have, we, we the members of Congress, the senators and the representatives, you know, we have been, we've taken care to, to speak up and we're looking to change things. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, you know, with, if anyone in the community has any issues, it sounds like they're already reaching out to your office. Um, is that an open invitation then to reach out to your office should anything occur? Or yeah, you... yeah, and yes, exactly. And I think um, what we often do is we often can be the conveyor uh, to law enforcement or other agencies. So um, if you're AAPI in the community, 
you feel more comfortable sort of reaching out to our office. We may not be the office that solves the problem, but we can connect you with the office that can. Uh, and, uh, and we want to be there to help build those ties and those relationships so that um, the city of Riverside and all the other agencies, municipal agencies here can, can help you. Thank you so much, Congressman. This has been an amazing hour, super insightful. Um, thank you so much for sharing not only the history of, I mean, our country and our nation, um, but also too within Riverside, some of the major things that happened within Riverside. And um, I cannot thank you enough for shedding some light today on the racism um, on the AAP, AAPI community. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I, if there's anything else you want to add? <laughs> Just that, you know, I love Riverside. I grew up, I was born and raised here, and um, Riverside has a, a, an amazing history. And, uh, you know, it was founded by an, an abolitionist. Um, but there's a, a mix. We got I mean, before we do a hagiographic sort of lionizing of John W. North, I think we have to also connect with that before the land was John W. North's, it was that of Native Americans who lived here. And I think um, it's, it, it <laughs> and look, that's not, I mean, he, there was a good part of him, which was the abolitionist and somebody who would stop a, a lynching, which he did in Tennessee, apparently. Um, I, I, I think history, history has a way of being humbling. Uh, so that none of us, none of us can be so perfect uh, and too proud. Um, but we also can be proud. That's kind of strange. We can be both. We can we can both draw pride and humility uh, from understanding our history. Um, and I think we need both. We need both pride and humility to be able to create a future when we all get along, when we're nice and not cruel to one another. And I think we all want that. I think we all want that. And uh, and I think uh, we possibly are the, the place best positioned on earth to make that happen. Definitely too, with history, there seems to be a sense of hope that we're gathering from it, right? Yeah, pride, humility, and hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, thank you so much again, Congressman. I so appreciate your time. Um, and thank you, our audience out there, for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk About Community Trauma with Riverside Community Health Foundation and our amazing Congressman of the 40, 41st District of California, Congressman Mark Ticano. Um, for more information about Riverside Community Health Foundation, you can always check out our social media, um, on Insta follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and then obviously also to follow Congressman Takano as um, he makes his way back over to, to DC with policy making um, in, in support of our community. So if that, I guess that's it for us. Thank you so much again, Congressman. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Bye.